Well, I'm going to take my thoughts today out of uh, the 19th Psalm, which I read a little bit of at the beginning, and Psalm 20 and uh, Psalm 21. I'd like to tell you I have some great organizing scheme in this, but I don't. And so they're on the same, they're on facing pages in my Bible when I close it, so that's my unifying theme today. They're all on the same page. <laughs> so I'm a... Uh, I, I wanted to talk about Thanksgiving without just doing a sermon on being thankful. Uh, if, you've, if you've given a speech or a sermon on a similar topic, I'm uh, 40, 44 years in the ministry this February, and I don't know how many Thanksgiving sermons I have done. So you obviously are going, yeah, what have I got to say about being thankful? So what I rather am doing is picking out some elements in these uh, three psalms that are things that I am thankful for, that we all can be thankful for, because they are ultimately are about the nature and the character of God. And when you talk about being thankful, ultimately, the, the concept is not to be mindful of the things that I have, but to be mindful of where they come from or why I have them. The, the, the point is not what can I measure or how much can I measure, how abundant is my blessing or how abundant is my bank account, but the understanding that throughout the course of my life, God is the one who has provided for me in every way that I can imagine and many ways that I probably still haven't yet begun to comprehend. And so I'm going to take a little bit of an element from uh, each of these psalms, and I'm not reading the, the whole, the entirety of, of any of them, uh, but, uh, but I want to start with that 19th psalm and the verse that is so familiar to us. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their sound has gone out through all the earth, and their world, or their words to the end of the world. Father, as we join together today, we pray your help, your grace, and your blessing in our hearts and our minds as we ponder your goodness in our lives. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. In my head, I'm thinking of these as three mini devotionals. I'm normally a 30-minute preacher, but at the book of Revelation, I've been watching the time. I've been averaging about 37 minutes. So I've been, I've been six minutes over for about the last 15 weeks, so I actually owe you three weeks of no preaching. If, 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 if we were being fully honest, that would be the way I would do it. And, and, and it's a holiday weekend, so I kind of like to try and keep my, uh, my thoughts brief. But the problem is, all too often my thoughts are brief, but my words are not. So, so my, my goal is, is to be uh, concise and, and, and focused on this. And, and so the first thing that I want to talk about this morning from this particular passage of Scripture is the desire that God has to make His glory known. And, and to do that in the sense of, of, of personalizing it in our lives. The, the, the psalmist says in this passage that the very heavens declare the glory of God. Now, we all know that he's not trying to say that takes the place of preaching or sharing the gospel. But what the writer is saying is a, a person who truly understands the complexity of the world we live in almost is bound to acknowledge that there is a designer or there is a creator. These things didn't just happen. They didn't just come together. The, the universe is vast and the measurements of it are, are mind-boggling to us. We, we can't even begin. You know, I've talked about the speed of light, that alone should almost make you believe in God because that 186,000 miles a second is, is a number I can't even wrap my head around. I've used this example before, I don't want to belabor it, but the idea is if I were to stand on the equator and I could shoot a bullet that would follow the curvature of the earth and I would pull the trigger, the bullet would go around the earth and through my body seven times in one second. That's how fast light travels. The number of galaxies that we have, the, 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 the stars, every time you see an article about the stars, they're expanding the count. They're, they literally have gotten to the place where they say, we have no idea 
how many stars there are because we can't even really see to the edges of the universe. And, and if we're talking about the speed of light and it's expanding in every direction, it may well be expanding in every direction at the speed of light. It may be growing so quickly that man would never, if we lived here a million years, would never be able to develop the, the means by which we can examine this world that we live in. But the concept here is that God is there in all of creation, and I'm going to use this phrase, waiting to be discovered. The majesty of what He has done, the way that He has made us. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The number of complex systems that are at work in your body alone is almost mind-boggling. The, the means by which God sustains life and, and, and all of the, the virtues that attach to that are there for us to, to live with a sense of wonder and amazement at God's provision for our lives. And to think that we, we live on this planet out of how many bodies there are scattered throughout the universe and yet God sent His Son to this world, to this planet, to offer redemption to a society that was in rebellion, utter rebellion against him. He says there's no place you can go where that speech is not heard. There's no language, there's no ethnic group, there's no population that was, is without a witness because God's glory has been revealed through all of creation. And the simple concept is God wants us to know him. God invites us to come near to Him. And so if I think of the things I'm thankful for, it's not that I live in a complex world. It's that it's the God who made this complex world invites me to be in fellowship with Him. He invites me to come and spend time in His presence. He invites me to come and share the burdens of my life, the, the things that weigh on my heart. He says, bring them to me, all ye who labor, all ye who are heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. I will give you that sense of peace and that sense of calm. And the idea ultimately is that God's love and God's presence and God's power is what is there to comfort us and sustain us in time of trouble and in time of difficulty. We can bring these matters to Him and know that He will abide with us. But beyond that, if you go to the, the, the second paragraph or third paragraph I guess technically the second grouping in my mind as I look at this those verses about the law of the Lord or God's word in verses 7 8 9 the law of the Lord is perfect or the idea of the law of the Lord is mature it's complete it has everything that we need Peter says God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness he doesn't tell us everything he knows but he's given us everything we need there's a big difference in those two statements. No matter how much we know, we only know this much. And we, uh, we like to talk about science in this day and age, and of course we're talking about it in the context of coronavirus and the appropriate ways to address that, to, to deal with it, and all of those things. But, but you know, the whole point with science is not that science creates truth. Science can only discover truth. Truth already exists. Scientists are not the ones who make these laws. They are the ones who figure out how these things operate. How many centuries were we on the planet before they began discussing that thing called gravity? You know, Isaac Newton just a few hundred years ago. They, they didn't even, I won't say ponder, but they didn't even have the means by which they could examine those things. And so the point of science is not to find reasons to have a dispute with God. The point of science should be to have a sense of awe about the world that God has made for us. God made this planet precisely as it is to sustain human existence. To keep us. And in, and in the original design... Had man not sinned, he would have lived forever in that perfect state. Now, God knew before he made man what was going to happen, but he made a planet that would give us everything we need to live, and if we properly keep that association with the planet as we ought to, it would continually lead us back 
to who God is and what God has done for us. So he says God's law is complete or it's mature, it's fully developed in our lives, bringing a conversion or bringing restoration to the soul. The 23rd Psalm says he restores my soul. He brings me back to what I am supposed to be. His testimony is sure or it's solid or it's believable. It's truthful. It's faithful. You can rely on it. His testimony is sure and that makes the simple person wise. You're not wise when you understand science. You're wise when you understand God. Wisdom is not about the accrual of knowledge. Wisdom is about what to do with the knowledge you have obtained. The problem with most people is their wisdom makes them proud and then makes them strive ever more for independence from God, and that is not a sustainable lifestyle. That, and that's what the whole book is about. It's what the book of Revelation is about. The world cannot exist by their own strength, by their own design, by their own desire, by their own purposes. They can only live as they find that harmony or that communion or that connection, as it were, with God. You know, what, what's it mean to have a connection with God? Probably many of you now in your car have this thing. And you don't even have to insert a key to start your car. Why? Because this connects with the brains in your car. So now I not only have a phone that's smarter than me, I have a car that's smarter than me. The list is endless. Coffee makers are smarter than I am. Toasters are smarter than I am. They're all there. But what's the point? As long as the car brain and this fob can communicate, I can start my car and go wherever I want. But if the line of communication is hindered because the battery is dead or there's some technical glitch, this thing does me no good. And there's probably a way to do it, but I don't know if I have a way I can start my car without the fob. If there is, I don't know what it is. I'll have to get the manual out and figure it out someday when that moment comes. But the point of the universe is we can only truly be what God wants us to be when we recognize that grand design of his hand at work. The statutes of the Lord are right, and right, of course, is the root of the idea of righteousness rejoicing the heart. His commandment is pure. It enlightens the eyes or brings wisdom or understanding to our mind. The fear of the Lord is clean because it endures forever and his judgments are true and righteous altogether. And so the premise is when I observe the world, it should give me that basic sense of regard or respect for God. And when I understand that God is there, then it gives me regard for the book or the words or the law that God has given me that enables me to live in that habitat and maintain that appropriate sense of connection with God. God's glory is there for us to know and for us to enjoy. I want to go over to the 20th Psalm then for my second element of consideration. Uh, it says this, Psalm 20 verse 1, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you according to your heart's desire or just according to your heart and fulfill all of your purpose or all of your counsel. We will rejoice in your salvation. In the name of God, we will set up banners that the Lord has fulfilled our desire. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we remember the name of the Lord our God. Now, the second element that I want to talk about briefly is it, it, God makes himself known to us or makes himself knowable to us by revealing his glory, by revealing his truth, by revealing his wisdom. The second thing is the access that we have for every circumstance in our life. <clears throat> You know, there are, there are a variety of people and philosophies that, that people have when they look at the world. One of them is that basically it, they don't believe in God, but if they believe there's a God, they believe, well, maybe he made the world. But it's kind of like the old uh, alarm clock. He, he wound it all up 
and the universe is gradually running down. It's gradually running out of energy. Well, that's true, but it's not true because of a flaw in God's design. It's true because of corruption. It's true because of what man has done uh, to the world that God has made. God made it. It would have sustained us forever. But because man is involved, corruption always brings about an end other than that which God has designed. This psalm, the 20th psalm and the 21st, often are associated together as a, a psalm or a song used before they would go out to battle, go out to war, the 20th. And the 21st is a song that they would sing when they came back from battle with the victory. So the first one is like a prayer or a plea or, or a, a request for God to help you. And that's why it says, may the Lord answer you in the day of your trouble. May God be gracious to you. May he be responsive to you. May he be observant of your life and your circumstances. May he send you help from the sanctuary. And maybe that's the best phrase in here. You know, what's going on in your life? Things that are beyond your control? You need help from the sanctuary. You need help from God. Not this sanctuary, but from the very presence of God. And, and the concept here is the God who is glorious, the God who made all of these things, the God who is himself pure and holy and righteous and just and true, that God invites us in our fallen condition, in these bodies that are broken, that are under the curse, he invites us to come and ask his help when we have needs. So not only is God great, grand, and glorious, he's approachable. He invites us to come. He wants us to come. It, it, it makes him feel, uh, what's the word, needed or necessary in our life, or it shows that we understand we need him or he's necessary. That's probably a better way to phrase it. But the idea here for the nation of Israel was as they were going out to battle, whatever battle that was, whatever enemy was before them, they would go with the anticipation already firmly set in their heart that with God on their side, they would be victorious. And the simple truth of Scripture is Israel would have never lost any battle they ever fought if sin were not an issue. So, the heart of a believer is this, as long as I walk with God, as long as I endeavor to live by the counsel or the wisdom of his word, I know in every situation that I face that God is going to bring me through this battle and I'll be victorious on the other end. Now, you need to be careful how you parse that. That doesn't mean God answers every prayer the way I want him to answer every prayer. That doesn't mean I define what victory is. It means that the God who made it all, the God who is all-encompassing, the high and lofty one, Isaiah says, that inhabits eternity, that God knows precisely what I need. He knows precisely when I need it. He knows where I need to go. And the premise is that as long as I walk with him, he will bring me through every test and every trial. And Paul said that. He says, with every test, with every trial, there is a way. The King James uses the way of escape. There's a way through it is what it's saying. There's a way of coming out the other side without the plans of the world being realized. Without the intention or the desire or the design of the world to be fulfilled. And so he says, may God grant you according to all that's in your heart. May God fulfill your life so that you can rejoice in his salvation. Now I know that God saves his anointed. Now that's a verse that has messianic implications because the word Messiah basically means the anointed one of God. Now here's the premise though. Every one of his children is anointed by God. We are not the Messiah in the sense of the one who can take away the sin of the world, but we are, if we are born again Christians, we are his anointed. We have that presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and that's what this verse is saying. I know 
that the Lord saves those who walk with him. I know that the Lord saves those who are called, those who are chosen, those who are his. He will answer from heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and horses, but he says in verse 8, they have bowed down and fallen. They trust in their own wisdom. They trust in their own strength. See, and, and that's the problem with humanity. We, we always have a desire. We always have a design. But we have to discern between the desire of the flesh and the desire that God has for us. And the concept of faith is to help us identify that which is pleasing to God and walk in that way, to walk in that fullness, to walk in His presence and in His power. So he says, they trust in chariots and horses, they've bowed down and fallen. But he says, we remember the name of the Lord our God, we have risen and stand upright. Save us, Lord. May the king answer us when we call. And so the concept is, as they would go out to victory, really it was a song of praise before the battle ever began because they knew that God would ultimately work in every situation that which was needful or necessary in the lives of his people. And the third one, then, I want to take from the 21st Psalm, which, as I said, is kind of a, uh, a companion piece with the 20th Psalm. He says, The king will have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation how greatly he will rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold on his head. He asked life from you, and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him. For you have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Now, the king. David's the king. This is the song he would sing after he wins the battle. But honestly, the song after the battle is the same as the song before the battle. Because by faith, as it says in Hebrews 11, they conquered. By faith, they prevailed. The book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches, to he who overcomes, I will give, da 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 The premise is, God's blessing rests on the king of Israel. The Old Testament concept of a king is carried into the New Testament, and we are called a nation of priests, and we are a royal priesthood. We are a kingly priesthood. The premise of the blessing that rests with the king in Israel is a type, as it were, of the blessing that rests with all of God's people who walk with him, or all of God's people who fall in that category of the anointed. That anointing from God is not now parceled out to a single leader. It's not a nationalistic thing. It is a realization that when we walk with God, we are invincible. Now, you know what I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to say anything like Superman or any of those kinds of things. But it means when we walk with God, we cannot be defeated. Doesn't mean everything I want to get. But when we walk with God, we cannot be defeated. The world can do their worst. But they cannot remove the blessing of God from your life. They cannot sever or separate. Romans chapter 8. None of these things can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the idea of that blessing that he talks about for the king in this 21st Psalm is the concept of God's favor in our lives as we live for him. You meet him with blessings of goodness. You set a crown of gold on his head. You ask life from him and he gave it to you. Length of days forever and ever. Now what's the promise to David? The Davidic covenant that God would rule and reign from David's throne. So the fulfillment for David is not found in David's time on the earth. The fulfillment for David is found in the Messiah's reign 
from Jerusalem during the millennium and then from the new heavens and the new earth where we don't need the sun, we don't need the sea, we don't need any of those things, we don't need a temple because God himself is our sanctuary. This life on this planet in this fallen world is a life lived by faith, it's a life lived, a life lived by walking in the spirit. This body is going to the ground but the soul or the spirit of man the, the soul or the spirit of the believer is preserved and protected through every test and every trial as long as we walk with him. When it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, it means God's word will keep you in every test, in any test that life brings your way. Depression, discouragement, fear, those things are not from God. Those things are not God's design. Those things creep in when we lose that connection. Those things creep in when all of a sudden we doubt whether the signal is getting through. But when we live by the word, when we walk in the spirit, as he says, if we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. The concept is the fulfillment from God in our lives preserves every element of our soul, of our spiritual being. It's redeemed and it's kept and it's guarded by God so that we have that sense of fulfillment. The top of the page, my Bible says, God's blessings on the king. If you take that to the New Testament, it would be God's blessings on the believer. Doesn't mean I have perfect health. Doesn't mean I have perfect wealth. Doesn't mean I don't have problems. Doesn't mean I don't have difficulties. Doesn't mean I don't struggle with feelings. It simply means that when I allow God's word to be the source of my wisdom, when I allow the spirit to continue to have that freedom in my life, then the soul is preserved from the ravages that trial and tribulation would otherwise bring. We don't wear out as Christians. The body wears out, but the soul doesn't wear out. You know that phrase, burnout, everybody loves that burnout. I'm burned out. Well, you might be, but you don't have to be. You don't have to be. Because if the Holy Spirit is that dunamis, and you know me, you've heard me talk about it enough, I prefer the word dynamo. I don't need dynamite. I don't need to blow my life up every day. I need the dynamo. I need that unending energy, that unending power, that unending work of the Spirit that always supplies what is necessary. Any constriction in that supply is not on God, it's on us. And so when I think about what does it mean to be thankful, it means this. It means I should, from Revelation, or excuse me, from Psalm 19, I should have that appreciation for the world that God has made. The heavens declare the glory of God. The manifestation of His beauty. The manifestation of His majesty. The manifestation of His truthfulness. The manifestation of his righteousness. Every attribute or element of God, he says, the world declares God's glory. Then the further declaration from God's word. That law that is perfect, that converts the soul or restores the soul. That preserves and protects and keeps me. That motivates the design and the desire of my heart. And then the knowledge that when I, quote, go to battle that I don't go to battle alone. I don't go to battle in my own strength, in my own wisdom. I'm not relying on some man-made capability. I'm relying on the eternal God to preserve me. I'm relying on the eternal God to keep me. I'm relying on Him to say that word that keeps the enemy at bay. And Psalm 23 says, He prepares a table before me in the very presence of mine enemies. That's a good representation after Thanksgiving dinner, isn't it? God prepares the feast. The hounds may be in your yard. The wolf may be knocking at the door. Let me in or I'm going to huff and puff and blow your house down. But when the house is built on the solid rock, he can't get in. He can't win. He can't prevail. And the third element of that is the understanding that God himself sets the crown of life on my head. The world can't take that. 
They have no power, no authority. They can ravage my possessions, but they cannot touch the soul because the life of the soul is from God. And that soul, that spirit that God has given me tells me I'm going to live forever. I shall never die. I shall never be separated from God. I'll never face the second death. I will only know the joy forever that comes from knowing God. And so what is it for Thanksgiving? It's not about what I've got. It's about who I have. Or more precisely, it's that he has me. He's the one who knows. Every moment of your life beginning to end. He's the one who knows exactly what you need. And when we truly come to know God, we can say with absolute certainty, he will not fail me. He will not fail me. He will not leave me. I am not alone. I will not fear what man can do. Because the eternal God himself has made me a part of his family. I am secure forever in the work that Jesus Christ has done for me. Let's pray. Father, how glad we are for your love. Lord, it's very easy for our priorities to be skewed. It's very easy for our attention to be diverted. We allow the trials, the tribulations of life to supplant the joy that you have given us. And yet Jesus said, my joy I give to you, my peace I give to you. Not peace as the world gives, not the kind of satisfaction the world seeks, but that satisfaction which is forever, which does not erode, which does not rust, moths can't corrupt it and thieves cannot steal it because it is secure by the very agency of God himself, the God who made all things, the God who makes himself known in majesty and glory, and the God who draws near to us, and the God who invites us to come and sit at his table. You put that robe of righteousness around us, and you invite us to rule and to reign with you. We are already a part of that family. We're already a part of that kingdom. The kingdom of God isn't built on the planet. It's built in the hearts, in the souls of his followers. And so, God, we praise you for your goodness. We praise you for your kindness. We thank you for your graciousness and your work, faithful work in our lives. Help us as we leave this building. We're entering the Christmas season, the to and fro. Lord, in all of it, may we rejoice at the simplicity that you sent your son into our world because you loved us. You sent your son into our world to redeem us. You sent your son to our world that we might be a part of the family of God. And if you did that while we were sinners, how much more will you not through that son who now sits at your own right hand freely give us all that we need for life and godliness. We honor you, we rejoice in you, and we give thanks together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's our benediction.